I would like to make a case today that career development is the missing link for making sense of 21st century learning. To get started, I have a question for you. When you were a child, did you imagine being a nanomechanic? How about a memory augmentation surgeon? Something I think I could use today. How about a parallel programmer? Chances are that none of you, when you were a child, had these occupations in mind for yourself. And chances are that none of you here today even know what any of those things are. And there's a good reason for that. A group of British futurists were asked, given the current demographic, social, and economic trends, what jobs do they think will be in high demand in the year 2030? And that's some of the list that they came up with. But before you get thinking that this is all just too fantastical, think about this. The top 10 in-demand occupations in the year 2013 had not been invented in the year 2000. So the kids who graduated from their schooling in 2013 faced a radically different occupational landscape than they faced when they started their schooling. And those same kids are likely to face 7 to 14 occupational changes by the time they reach the age of 38. That's going at the rate of about one every two years. Some people estimate that in the next year, we will create more new information than the entire human race had created in the last 5,000 years. So as the Ministry of Education website here in BC says, the world has changed and the way we educate our children needs to change too. Well, they're right, the world has changed. And it's changed at such a fantastic rate that the ability to predict and plan a future place has gone out the window. What we normally hold out as the great hope for managing in this time of change is this 21st century learning. And there are two really broad categories of themes that uh, relate to 21st century learning. One is that we develop personalized learning. And two, that we find ways to use technology and human process to liberate the learning process. Now this is the talk I was supposed to do, and I'm gonna to try to do it in 60 seconds to give you the talk I really wanna do. So I was gonna talk about the myth of this digital technology. I look at technology as simply a way to solve a problem. Nothing more than that, just a way to solve a problem. So what problems do we face in education today then? Well, number one, I think, we need to integrate new learning opportunities and methods into our teaching practices. More of the guide by the side than the sage on the stage, material that you're all very, very familiar with. But how do we integrate technologies so that kids have a greater access to not just to information, but making sense of that information and to connecting with each other. A second problem that we have is that we need to do all this wonderful educating in vastly different and highly complex, multicultural, multilingual, and multi-historical contexts. The challenge is bigger than ever before, and we need a technology, a way to deal with those problems. Third, we need to find a way to better document the impact of the interventions that we do in education. All over North America, public education is increasingly under siege. Funds are being withheld or withdrawn or diminished. And increasingly, governments look to simplistic answers to determine how well a system is doing. Things like scores on achievement tests. I think we should be focusing on what I call the delta effect. Delta is the scientific symbol for change. And the delta effect should be that we measure not a raw level of achievement, but we tell a school you're doing brilliantly by the amount of development and change that those children experience. That's a good school. <laughs> and we need to provide a meaningful framework for learning. Perhaps the single greatest criticism of the, tra quote, traditional modes of education is that kids feel disconnected. It doesn't make sense to them. It's not relevant. So it's this framework of meeting that I really want to focus on for the time I have left. Now, for those of you that need to sleep already, uh, here's the main message. Personalized learning cannot succeed without creating personalized pathways. So you need to drift off, you've got the main message. <laughs> to illustrate my point, I'd like to tell you about the curious case of the little beaver. 
Shortly after I completed my graduate training in counseling psychology, I took a job as a counselor at a community college. And one of my very first clients was Little Beaver. And I'll give you the kind of summary, the case history of this individual who had probably more challenges than any other person I'd worked with before or since. Number one, he was a middle 30s male with functionally illiterate. He had about a grade two level of education, reading and, and math level. He was Aboriginal, had been bullied most of his life, and had fought and been a victim of both covert and overt racism for his entire existence. Number three, to help him get away from the pain of his existence, he used alcohol. He drank. And the impacts and results of his alcohol and his drinking were severe disruptions at many, many points in his life. And number four, he had a real anger management problem. He would blow into these violent eruptions of rage at the slightest provocation. And in fact, that's why he was referred to me uh, by the English teacher who he threatened to beat up. And the English teacher, instead of just kicking him out of the, the college, said, well, maybe you should try counseling first. He appeared in my doorway, and most times people would say things like hello or something like that. Little Beaver said, do you know who I am? I said, no, I do not know who you are. He said, my name is Little Beaver, and that's my professional name. Uh, I got that name because I wrestled in the Stampede Wrestling, and I've won two championship belts, so don't mess with me. The other thing that became apparent this first time that I saw him was why he got the name Little Beaver. He was about three foot six, and he wrestled in those obscene days they used to call midget wrestling. And the little beaver was the handle they gave to him to denote both that he was a midget and that he was Aboriginal. He also told me that all the money he earned throughout his career was stolen by the person who he thought was supposed to be his manager and his best friend. So there's a case, there's a context. Now I'd like to return to this notion of career and see how we can fit this in. I'm hoping to stretch your ideas about what career really means. This is what I mean by it, and I'll ask you to pretend that this is so for the next 10 minutes and 12 seconds. Career is the constellation of life roles that an individual plays over his or her lifetime. So you play a role as a parent, you play a role as a child, you play a role as a sibling, as a leisureite, and one of the roles that you play is that of worker. And it's how we live out those multiple roles at any one time and over time that defines our career. And so in many, many ways, your career is your life story. And when I said to Little Beaver, how would you like to author a story for your future that is different from the story you've lived so far today? He said, that's exactly why I'm here. And there was energy and there was passion in his voice. Our job as educators is to give every child the tools they need to write autobiographies, stories that they help to create an author, so that they're not written stories by other people who have made decisions for them. But I also have to transform a couple of myths before I really get into the good stuff. So here's some myths about career development that I want to rattle around in your heads just a little bit. The first myth is that career development is a problem. You're in grade 11, you're in grade 12, and you still don't know what you want to do with your life? Oh my gosh, whatever is going to become of you. You are going to waste so much time. No, career development is not a problem. Career development is quite normal. If the occupational landscape is going to be so different in 10 years, why do we do that silly thing about forcing people to make decisions prematurely? Career development is just normal stuff. The second piece is that career development is about planning for the future. Zzz, wrong. Career development is not just planning for the future. In fact, this, I think, is one of the greatest disservices we do in school, is that we say, imagine where you're going to be in 15 years, and how do we help you get there? Kids can't imagine that, and they're right. They're sane. They shouldn't even be trying to imagine that because it's going to be different from what any of us think. Career development is living intentionally in the present living intentionally in the present, incorporating those roles and those things that are meaningful to you and making sure they're part of every walking, living day. 
And when I invited little beaver to live intentionally in the present, because we can't control the future and we can't change the past, but if you act today, you may be able to influence tomorrow. That made sense. That made sense to him. None of the therapy and rehab and all the rest he had been through before made any sense whatsoever. Finally, that career development is a purview of guidance. No, it's not. Career development is everybody's responsibility. And as soon as we enlisted the support of his wife and that English teacher was ready to kick him out of college and other people in the school system, his growth was rather remarkable. I told you about four technology challenges that we have. And the reason that I shifted my presentation is because all of those things ask questions from the system's view. And I think it's time we started asking the question from the learner's view. So what technologies do we need? What questions do we need to solve from the perspective of the individual? Well, the first one is simply how in the world do I acquire and then make sense of all this information? Information is ubiquitous. It's all over the place. And I need to find ways to make sense of it so I can make better choices. We call that career literacy. The second question that needs to be answered, the second problem to be solved, is how do I find hope? Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no hope, there is no future. People who have no hope refuse to act in the present. It just makes sense. And once I find this hope, how do I build and sustain the enthusiasm, the energy, just the plain will to be continuously adaptive? If you've got to make 10 changes in the next 20 years, you better have some of that energy. There's a lot of interesting research going on uh, around the role that grit has in successful people. But I think we need to take it beyond grit, which is just stick to and call it gumption. And that's enough energy to actually act on your environment today. We need gumption. The third set of questions that we need to answer for individuals is where do I fit in this world? And that was probably Little Beaver's biggest problem because he had no sense of how he could possibly fit in this rapidly changing world that had discarded him so many times. What is available for me and how do I get a balance between all that I want and need and all the world around me? That's known as career context. We can't help somebody until we know the world that they're from. And when we know the world with where they're from, then we can help them make sense of that world. And the fourth set of technologies we need is the ability to make these decisions and take these actions, and here's a key, in a way that allows me to maintain a sense of who I am, my own uniquely constructed identity. How do I take pride in what I do? And that's something that we call career integrity. Now, if we can build career integrity in our young people, we create pathways for the future, and then we make learning have a lot of sense. If we put it together in a cycle, this is what we tend to end up with. And the cycle doesn't have a starting place. You can start with whatever you're given. In the case of Little Beaver, we started with gumption. We created that little spark of hope that maybe by doing something today, his tomorrow could be better. And that spark of hope caused him to act in that day and develop his literacy skills in, in a much deeper way. And when he did that, he was able to see his world, the world around him in a much more sensible way. It had hope and possibility for him. And because the world around him now had some hope and possibility, he developed a sense of pride in who he was. He developed integrity that I can fit. And as soon as that integrity developed, guess what happened to his gumption and his hope? Up they went. In fact, he went through that cycle in a very, very rapid process. Within two weeks, he had completely stopped drinking. In three months, he never had a single behavioral report on him. Also, in three months, he knocks on my door one day and he says, guess what? I say, what? He said, I just wrote and passed my grade nine equivalency exam. He said, we did it. There's nothing going to stop me now. So in three months, he goes from functionally illiterate to a grade nine equivalency and a, and a heart and mind for the future. So if we put this together, this notion that there is creativity and there is passion, the place where gumption and integrity meet, when those things are enabled, however you do it is great career development. It's also great teaching. However you do that, then we foster literacy and then we act in our career context. Now there's a couple of pieces to the Little Beaver story that I haven't told you yet. The first 
is something I discovered about 20 years later. I was doing an internet search, something not available to me when I first met Little Beaver. Did a Google search and I thought, I'm going to check out my old friend Little Beaver. And there he comes and there's Little Beaver with his stampede midget wrestling championship belts. Except the picture of him did not match the picture of my client. And it turns out that my client, whose real name was Alvin, had invented the whole persona of Little Beaver. He had taken it on himself because his own identity was just too painful to present to anybody else. And so he lived through this fiction that he wanted everybody else to believe in. I thought that was really sad. But the second piece that I didn't tell you is what happened after he left my office on that day celebrating his major achievement. He decided to celebrate with a glass of beer, which led to a second and a third and a fourth. And late that night, as he was walking home along a dark, unlit road, he was struck by a car and killed. And so his story never got to be told. And I thought, that was a shame. That was just a shame, just at the place when he was beginning to do an autobiography to write his own story, the demons of his past caught up with him. And I also wondered, how would his life have been different had we had these tools and these conversations when he was in school? Would it not have made a difference for him? So here's my big, hairy, audacious conclusion for 21st century learning. Coherent career practice is not just a component that we add on to the 21st century learning picture. Instead, it is the larger frame within which the picture is placed. It is a means by which we establish meaning and help give purpose and direction and most importantly, connection. If you want to destroy somebody, do one of three things. Remove them from all past connection, remove them from present connection, or alienate them from the future. Little Beaver had all three of the, those things going on in his life. Our job is to provide a framework where that alienation does not occur. Thank you.